I'm Anil Dash, Roman is right. He told you the truth. It's nice when people tell you the truth these days. Tag yourself, I'm the bag of garbage. All right, um, so a little bit of introduction about me. I am Anil Dash. Uh, some of you, I, I feel like I was seeing earlier folks that I know from the internet, people I've uh, argued with on Twitter or who've sent me really good music recommendations. It's good to see all of you. I'm a real person, I exist. Uh, and these days people know me uh, also because I work at a company called Glitch, uh, which how many of you know about Glitch? We'll talk about it a little bit later. It's a place that people create things. It is uh, trying to be something that we want to contrast to this feeling. So much of the internet today feels like garbage. How many people agree with this sentiment? How many people have felt this? All right, don't clap. What we're going to do, this is something you never get to do at these conferences. We are going to boo. How do you feel about the people that make the content recommendation rec rec algorithms on YouTube? How do you feel about that? You can do better. Come on, here we go, there we go. We never get to boot. That was a good one. So what I want to hear is how we feel about the people that are recommending content that radicalizes vulnerable people and makes them be violent on the internet. How do we feel about that? There we go. So thank you for booing me, and thank you for booing all of us who are culpable in these things. But I want to call this out because we don't really often get to reckon with the choices that are made that cause this garbage to happen. And one of the people who made some of this garbage to happen is me. And I want to talk about how that happened and what it means for each of us that's been participating in these problems. Because the problems are getting worse. So when I was young, the thing they would tell us, warning us about being on video games or getting on the internet was like, you'll ruin your eyes, right? It was like, you're gonna, that's gonna, you know, that's gonna make you not be able to sleep well. Like that was the sort of concern. It was not, this will radicalize mass violence movements. Right? It was not, this is going to be a thing that tears apart your family and makes Thanksgiving a horrible mess of people telling you things that are not true that you can't even argue with because they're so deep in the hole, right? And we've all had that experience. If you haven't, then you should go to Thanksgiving. You should see, it's like that. And um, this thing is getting worse. It is undermining social institutions that we rely on. It is undermining the fabric of society. It is not only because of technology, and maybe technology didn't cause it, but it sure didn't help. What's happening on the web didn't help. And then the question is, how did this happen? Right? I genuinely believe, I mean this very sincerely, I don't think anybody was like, this is my nefarious plan. I don't think, well, there's a couple, but there's mostly, not that many folks who twirled their mustaches and said, I have this nefarious plan. We're going to make an app for sharing short text messages, and it's going to make people turn into Nazis, right? But that is something that has happened, and it happened to us, but it's also something that was caused to happen. So I want to go back a little bit. We're going to, we're going to story time a little bit. And part of it is um, some of you are of sufficient vintage like I am to remember this moment, but most people were not actually uh, engaging with social media as far back as 20 years ago, uh, which is when I started blogging and started working on building these tools. And I want to give a little bit of context because that's sort of the dawn of the modern era of social platforms and social media and social networks. And what was interesting about that moment in the history of creating these technologies was a lot of us were making stuff. In fact, I would say maybe even the majority of people who were really actively engaged on the web were creating things on the web. Back then, the state of the art was stuff like GeoCities. How many people ever made a GeoCities page? Good show of hands. All right, you can um, help those people out of their seats later because we're all very elderly now. Um, and some people were making stuff uh, using you know, Microsoft front page. People were using all these sort of very primitive tools. And then later on, a whole sort of cohort of other tools came along. I was like, lucky I got to work on, work on a really early platform called LiveJournal, one of the first big social networks that reached about 10 million users back when that was a big number. And so there's something really interesting about that moment, too, in that the teams, if we looked at, I think it's some of the seminal social media platforms or social platforms like uh, Blogger, one of the first big blogging tools, uh, Flickr, one of the first big photo sharing tools, uh, a tool I got to work on, Movable Type, all these had, um, I think not coincidentally, teams where the co-founders were men and women, were people of different genders, people of different races. There was a lot of interplay. There was actually a ton of people of different social classes working on these tools. And I got to know a lot of these teams or work with a lot of these people. And there were a lot more people in the room building these tools than you would expect based on the way the industry looks today. And in fact, I knew more 
diverse founders of major social platforms 20 years ago and 15 years ago than I do today. That's extraordinary, because it's not great. It wasn't great then, and it's really bad now. But what happened is all those perspectives came to the table, and they made these tools that did define a new space online. People's understanding of the web at the turn of the century, doesn't that sound like 100 years ago? At the turn of the century. But at the turn of the century, the understanding of the web was it was something you could create, not just something that you consumed. And so we had a lot of people who were making tech, and it felt like everybody made it. Right? It felt like it was not that uncommon to run into somebody talking about how they had made a website for the band that they liked, or a fan site for the group that they were a fan of, or to show off their art projects or their writing. It was pretty normal. And in fact, back in the day, when you connect on like AOL and dial up to the internet, you'd have your own little web page, and a lot of people made those. That was normal. And then we decided to get serious. We were going to professionalize. If everybody was going to show up, we had very good intentions. It had to be usable, right? The design should be consistent. We had to make sure that everything was going to be a pleasant experience, a predictable experience. And of course, we had to make some money so this stuff was sustainable, so we had to monetize it. All these sort of very well-intentioned, very thoughtful, reasonable decisions were made to get serious about turning this sort of free-for-all of the web, this weird era of the web, into something that was a serious platform where businesses could be run and people could really establish themselves as what we would later come to call influencers, and thank God for influencers. How would I know what to do in my life if I hadn't had influencers? And so the web got a lot more serious. And a lot of things happened during that shift. All of a sudden, we started to make choices. What were we going to encourage? What were our defaults going to be? What were we going to prompt people to do? What were we going to show them, right? We've all encountered this. Discovery is really hard. Search is really hard. Let's, let's give them some good defaults. Let's present some good choices. So we started making choices on their behalf. And it did start, as I've said a couple times, with the best of intentions. I certainly had good intentions when I thought about what should the policies be about what kind of expression we allow, what kind of expression we encourage. And then an interesting ha thing happened. As the money came in, and the investors came in, and the rest of what had then been the software industry became the tech industry, became the internet industry, who was we that got to build these companies and participate in these companies got smaller? Within the span of a few years, all of the women who had co-founded those major pioneering platforms that I mentioned not only were pushed out of their companies, but most left the industry. And I saw that pattern happen over and over and over for every kind of underrepresented group. In the early days of blogging, when I started, the people around me were of every background. There were extremely prominent queer bloggers from day one, black bloggers from day one. They had voices as pertinent, as important, as vital to the development of the entire ecosystem, of the medium itself, as any other voices. But they didn't get exalted as the pioneers of the format. They got marginalized, they got pushed aside, they were not invited in when everybody came to benefit from creating these, to these tools. And again, there was no one nefarious person saying, let's push them out. There was a lot of talk about, well, we have to move quickly. And we have to make sure we get everybody in line with the plan. And wouldn't it just be easier if we picked all the folks who are already on board with what we want to do? And maybe we should look at the people we've already got. And that winnowing was a boil the ocean moment. It was one of those things, or a boil the frog moment, I'm sorry, where you kind of don't realize it's happening to you. And it happened around me as I saw the people around me start to feel less and less like a bunch of us wild, weird people, and a lot more like folks that all had the same set of goals. They were very aligned. They had uh, OKRs, I think they're called, and they had a very clear vision of what they wanted to do. But I didn't really understand anymore what they were trying to accomplish. But I tried to adapt. And one of the biggest reckoning points on this was around what we were going to allow to be the content that people shared. What I had grown up with and come up in the tech industry with was this era of 
sort of the internet is the last free bastion. There was a lot of rhetoric that sounded like the Wild West or like we're gonna have a new declaration of independence about cyberspace back when people talk about cyberspace. And it was this sort of very idealized version of like, the laws don't apply here, taxes don't apply here. I think that was really what they're focused on is the tax part. But the sense of we're starting from scratch and not a real fluency in what it meant, for example, to allow completely unaccountable speech to be amplified. And a lot of blurring the lines between what you could say and what we would promote, what you could do and what we would monetize. And so conceptually, it was absolutely true that we wanted everyone. We wanted the, the people with the unusual voices and the surprising and challenging things to say. We genuinely did want to empower voices that could not be heard through traditional channels, because it was true. There were a lot of people that wouldn't get published in a magazine or wouldn't get put on TV, and social media would help amplify and you know, share the message that they had. You know, the roots of major movements today, whether you look at Black Lives Matter or Me Too, some of the things that today we see as hashtags, go back to the earliest days of social media when the same underrepresented groups were using the same platforms to get their message out. They recognized this as a way to route around the media. And then there were the personal stories where we say, oh, these two people met each other in the comments on this one blog and they got married and it's this really wonderful, sweet story. And those things were all true. And my job for years was to tell those great stories. These people are changing the world, or meeting each other, making connections. And then we'd hear, well, this person got targeted. Or all these people really singled this person out to harass them. And then we'd say, well, that's just human nature. That's not our fault. We didn't cause that. We took credit for all the couples that met each other and all the movements that had positive impacts. And we took none of the blame or responsibility for any of the negative causes, negative externalities that happened as a result of these platforms. And so even though everyone was welcome, what that meant was anything was welcome. And a lot of people have used this analogy before, but I'll sort of bring it out again, which is to say, if you walk into a bar and there are two Nazis at the bar, that's a Nazi bar. That is not a free speech bar, that is a Nazi bar. I'm not going there. And it doesn't matter actually how many other people are there, and if two people in the back are making out, that doesn't make it, it's not, like, not a Nazi bar, it's still a Nazi bar because those guys are at the counter. And this is a very clarifying analogy because physical space, as it turns out, we've spent 10,000 years learning how to live together in. We spent a lot of time building rules around what's allowed. If you run in here and you start shouting slurs at me, you're gonna get kicked out. That's a pretty good rule, I like it. It's good, it makes us all happy, we feel good about it, and that guy's a jerk for trying to do it. Everybody agrees on this. If you don't, you're a weird, bad person. You shouldn't be here. And so that's something that's very simple, right? And all of a sudden, what, because we were making these web forms to type things in, we somehow lost that very obvious thing that we had learned over the prior 10,000 years of building civilizations. And I was one of those people. I was like, you know, we have to let people come in here and say awful things. Otherwise, how will people come in and say good things? That's a stupid idea. <laughs> but it's really common. It's really common. And it was shared by the people who were there around me doing the same work at other platforms. And the difference between me and them is they kept believing it and they became billionaires. And this was a very hard reckoning for me. I spent a lot of time wrangling with realizing my own culpability. Now, I didn't cause the worst of this stuff because I actually happened to leave that part of the industry about 10 years ago. I left San Francisco. I, left, I thought the tech industry for good. I didn't think I would ever come back. Um, but I certainly, um, as it turns out, the stock options are worthless anyway. That's generally the case. And, um, and I went back to the East Coast. I went back to New York, my home. And, um, and I sat with it for a long time. And I spent a lot of time working on what I could do out in the world and learning from the other disciplines that had built things like cities and governments and policy that actually help people. And I realized that not enough of us had had this reckoning. And it sat with me. It was heavy for a long time. It still is. I still feel the weight of this. That I had made choices that had given a platform for people to be awful to each other. Now, this is more than 10 years ago, so it wasn't yet at the point where they were forming mobs of torch-wielding white supremacists because of it. But you could see the seeds of it. You could see the beginning of it. And it started to raise some questions for me. And the moment where I had the sort of biggest question was the first time that a hate group online 
published my home address to come after my family. They did so on a platform that I had helped create. Now the guy who did it, uh, he's a major figure in the alt-right now, so good for him. I guess he's doing well selling books. Um, I should write a book. The, um, there's, a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of money in books. The, um, the thing that, that's interesting about it was, you know, obviously probably if he'd been kicked off of that platform that I wasn't running anymore, maybe he would have gone somewhere else. Might not have stopped it, but it was certainly clarifying to realize that I felt targeted and threatened and more than anything else furious because of something I'd been culpable in. And it made me question a lot of things about what I was doing in my career, in my life, and whether there was a path out. And I want to share with you the questions I started to ask and the questions that led me to actually coming back into the industry and building platforms again, building social networks again. The first one is what we're doing helping the most vulnerable people. We have to start there. The people most at risk, the people most likely to be harmed, is what we're doing helping them? At the very least, is it not harming them? And can we ensure that? And have we done everything we can to make sure that's the case? And who is able to create, not just to consume, but to create? And will the things that they create actually be out there in the world? Or are we going to promote the things that, well, might not be as helpful to the world? And this idea of who we empower is really hard to reckon with because there's this tendency to want to either go all the way to like, we're going to solve it for them. We're going to prompt what to create. We're going to give them all the tools and it'll just all be decided for them, which narrows how people express themselves. And the other extreme of like, well, this is for the professionals, the experts, the exalted, the people who are already good at this. And either of those extremes is a dangerous world to play solely to. When there are so many people that have stories they want to tell, but that still are not being reached by these tools in the way that was possible 10 or 20 years ago. And who's in the community? I think about uh, earlier this week, Gmail celebrated, I think, 15 year anniversary or something like that. And those of you who remember when Gmail was brand new, how did you get in? You got an invitation. Can you imagine what kind of community you'd have if you had to explicitly invite your neighbors? Well, we don't have to. We had it, and they were called racially segregated communities, right? We, have, we still have redlining. We still have all the forms of economic, social, cultural, and racial segregation that still exists in this country because of exactly this thing of, well, I'm just going to bring my friends and family in, and then everybody else is welcome after the fact. And then we have to think about our business models. Is it possible for us to build businesses that don't profit by surveilling people's data and sucking as much information out of them as possible? Yes, the answer is yes, right? Is it possible to build tools that do not profit from encouraging others to become part of radicalized violent movements? Yes, the answer is yes. If you're at a place that is not answering yes to those questions, leave. This was a moment of clarity I had. Now, generally, I said I'm present questions, but that one's an answer. Um, we have the power to make these choices, but we have to ask these questions about what's the worst thing that our company could profit from? And how do we make sure we don't do that? And then this one was so important to me. How do we get weird? How do we have weird things happening in our apps and online and on our phones? Like, everything is so boring. I don't want to see any more blue boxes that I'm supposed to put my photos in in exchange for them surveilling my life so I can see ads for crap I don't want to buy. I don't want that. I want weird things. And like, I do remember coming up in an era where everything on the web was somebody's weird pet project. And you'd be like, wow, you are really into that thing. <laughs> and it was great. It was great. It was the best thing on the internet, right? And you'd be like, I'm not as into that thing as you are into that thing, but I appreciate that you're into that thing. I love that internet. Right? And every single one of you had something that you saw online. You're like, wow, it's wild that that person spent that much time on it, but I'm glad for it. I'm glad they had that. That's what it's supposed to be about. And so, you know, I spent a time asking these questions, and I had honestly come to a pretty cynical place. My conclusion had been 
the ship has sailed. The, the Peter Thiels of the world are too powerful. We cannot change the course of what the internet is going to be anymore. And I started to think about what has to change. And it turns out it was as simple as each of us, and this is going to sound corny, but it's really sincere, actually believing that it could change. Like, when's the last time you changed the design of your personal website, right? You remember when you used to do that? You used to, like, actually design your little site. It wasn't just, like, a one-page landing page, and it wasn't some old, dusty, like, Tumblr or about.me page. But you actually made a design for your site, and you felt good about it. Or you saw somebody else's, and you're like, I want to learn how they did that. I know a lot of you did it, and I know it's been a long time since you did. But it really matters. When's the last time you made something weird online for fun? Not because you had to learn a certain framework for work, but because it was just like, I like to express myself in this way, in the same way that humans like to play music, or they like to you know, make films, or they do all the things they do to express themselves. And what was really clarifying for me was I realized how much our behaviors have changed in so many parts of our lives. Think about what you eat. If you're fortunate, most of us, do not solely eat factory farm fast food for every meal. It's part of our diets, but it's not the only thing we eat. Sometimes we have food that is recognizable, that we know the ingredients of, that was maybe cooked, prepared by us or by somebody we love. Maybe it was local. Maybe we know the farm or the name of the chicken that we're eating or whatever, right? There's all this stuff you can know about food, and it brings joy to all of us. All of us have, whether it's family or friends, this moment where we share a meal with them and it brings us together because there's this thing we made together for each other. Now look at your phone and look at the apps on your phone and look at the browser history on your browser when you get home and how many of the sites you go to or the apps that you use were made with love by somebody you know? How many of them were made by somebody local to you, somebody you know in your community? How many of them do you even know who made it, let alone whether they're a member of your community, somebody that you share values with, identify with, somebody that cares about what you care about, somebody who cares about not enabling the worst things on the internet to be garbage? It's a simple question, but it's a profound one because it is not radical to believe that some part of our diet could be things that people create, humans create, with a sense of connection to community. It's not that radical to believe it. And I know it because it's tr it was true. All those MySpace pages with the wacky things scrolling around on them and the marquee tags and the music auto playing, all those like, you know, uh, profiles on Asian Avenue and Black Planet and GeoCities and LiveJournal, all those people are still able to make that stuff. Their brains didn't get erased. They're all still out there. They just haven't been reminded that the internet, the web, used to be a thing that we make. And that epiphany, about realizing that it wasn't something so huge that had to change was what really inspired me the most when I got this chance to actually work with the team of people that remembered this. Um, and I sort of mentioned earlier, I get to work with this company, Glitch, that I, I joined a couple years ago, and watching this community of people building things. And there are a lot of others like this. There's a little indie site called NeoCities where people are building stuff. Um, there's another site I just saw um, yesterday. They got a big round of funding for Mighty Networks or building these independent sites. So there's lots of companies and platforms and tools in this movement building things on their own that start from this set of values that maybe we're not going to just have fast food, junk food online. We're not going to be force-fed things that are bad for us all the time. We're not going to have an algorithm choose, well, the French fries are the thing that performs the best, so this is what you're going to eat. And what we're able to do then, if we put the tools in people's hands and we remind each other that at least some percentage of what we make should be for ourselves and to nourish our souls, it is possible for people to create with intention. And I didn't believe it. I did not believe it. I thought, that time has passed. I'm being a Pollyanna. I'm being too much of an optimist. But what shook me out of this was seeing that old promise be fulfilled in a new way. The analogy I use here is my son. He's got the the Lego kids, he's eight years old. And everybody complains that the Legos these days, they just look like Star Wars or Lord of the Rings. You don't get to use your imagination. It's not a bucket of bricks. But I saw what he does is he tears all the stuff apart and he's still able to make whatever he can imagine. And that was what it felt like watching people create on the web these days, where these little weird pockets 
of the web have started to come back. And I know, you know, this is something that seems like it's too idealistic to hope for, but it's actually already working. I can tell you about the ones I see with the team I work with at Glitch. People have built millions of little apps. Overwhelmingly, 99% of them are open source. People remix each other's work. And this is happening across all these different sites. The only thing that's left for us to do to follow through on that promise, though, is for us to share them and talk about them and support each other creating them, spend our own time as designers, developers, creators, trying to build them, our time at work making sure we're not just optimizing how well we perform on platforms we don't own and control. This is an old-fashioned idea, but it is what the web was designed to do. And there is a renaissance happening where people are taking back control of these things. And the most amazing thing for me was it wasn't old guys like me talking about 20 years ago, the internet used to be better. I don't think it used to be better. It was differently bad. It just didn't have the significant problems that we have today. But there was an ethos that anybody could create it. And this thing, the most exciting part about it is when I talk to new creators, whether they're young or people who just weren't around on the internet back then, they're not saying this is a throwback. They're not saying this is some retro idea. What they're saying is, for the first time, somebody's taught me that this pervasive part of my life, this thing that's in every pocket, in every hand, on every desktop, is something I can control, I can have agency over, I can be the one that decides what it is, I can own it, and I can know that it's gonna to respond to the things I care about, and it's not gonna be part of making the entire internet into garbage. I hope you'll join me in pursuing that mission. Thank you. So if physical space, if we know how to operate in physical space, and we don't know how to operate in cyberspace, for lack of a better word. Cyberspace, right. <laughs> how do we take those models and apply them? Or is that the wrong way of thinking? I, you know, it's not gonna, I don't wanna overextend the analogy. Mm -hmm. It is different online than it is in the, in, the, in the physical world. But there are entire practices like urban design, uh, you know better than almost anybody, that figure out how we're gonna work together, how we're gonna live together, how we're gonna be around each other, and have these novel ideas, like we should be able to take up space together, even if we're not necessarily gonna interact and feel safe and comfortable around one another, mm -hmm. right? And acknowledge each other's humanity and human needs. And these are basic affordances that every single architect knows, that every single urban designer knows, that every single street planner knows, that every single person working on a construction site knows. And then our practice is, you know, almost as if we had designed, like how many people can we maximize getting through the front door of this building? Well, what are they going to do when they get in? I don't know. We're going to show them ads, but they're going to come through the front door of the building, right? And it's like, well, that's not a plan, right? That's not a, that is not a sacred space. Right. And so I think that's something that um, it, it, there are a lot of lessons to be learned from the other disciplines. And it's not, I mean, I think this is sort of cliched harangue of like, you know, we got to get people from the humanities into tech. And I was like, yes, sure, of course. But like, it, it's just more about like, we have to develop our practice of, nudging each other, of pushing mm -hmm. each other towards this thing that we already know. There's no part of what I talked about today that I don't think everybody here didn't instinctively know, but do we have the language for pushing each other, like, is this what we're doing? If, when I think about, you know, changing something that is broken, when I think about, like, getting off of fossil fuels, you talk about, mm -hmm. like, the whole 20th century is built on fossil fuels, and changing yeah. it, this flipping a switch is really hard. Yeah. When I think about social media, if we turned off the switch of social media, is that really a problem? Is that really, <laughs> like, are we really losing something? We should at least try it. I mean, I mean you know, I, so, how do you know? So, like, I wonder if, my, my big question is, is, like, maybe the fix is less or none or something. Like, have you thought about that? I have. I'm cautious about the, like, just exercise moderation, right? Because I think there are so many social obligations that compel us. Like, you know, to say, oh, well, you should just get off of Facebook. Well, there are tons of, you know, people that don't have as many advantages who can only get access to certain social opportunities and, you know, social mobility because of these social networks. So I, I, I don't think you can go cold turkey, and I think it's generally a position of privilege to be like, I'm not going to do that. Right. But, but there's a balance that is about moderation. Mm -hmm. And part of the challenge with moderation is we don't have other alternatives. If I say to you right now, like, you want to share photos with the family or the baby, 
what do you do? People take go to Instagram. They're, they're not like, well, I evaluated all the choices and I'm going to use Instagram because it has the finest filters. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like this, this is the thing. It's like you go where the people, where are. The people are. Yeah. And, and, and humans are so drawn to one another and so dependent on one another that this idea that one, these are not public goods, that these are controlled by for-profit companies and run by people who are somewhere between, you know, indifferent and wildly incompetent uh, to their responsibilities is this like, that's not sustainable. Mm -hmm. So at the very least, all of us, it's incumbent on all of us to make the other options. Right. And there's a little bit of discomfort. There's a little bit of like, oh man, okay, I'm gonna use whatever organic ingredients for this. I'm gonna have to go to another store to go shopping for that. But it's not like so arduous that we can't conceive of it. That's so great. Well, thanks for giving us so much to think about. Anil Dash, everyone. Thanks.